Welcome to the very first episode of the Brand Builder Show. My name is Ben and I will be your host and I am so pumped for this new podcast that is designed to help Amazon sellers become brand builders. And we're kicking it off with a big one today for the first episode, the inaugural episode of the Brand Builder Show. Uh, We've got John Elder coming on for the first episode today. John, uh, or he's known by his Twitter handle or his website, Black Label Advisor. John is someone who has built an Amazon business, started in 2014, sold it in 2019 for multiple seven figures and uh, someone that knows his stuff when it comes to not just selling random stuff online, but actually building a real cohesive business, something that's got a lot of value in it that becomes an asset that of course has you know ultimately changed his and his family's life and so today I'm going to be digging into all of that with him asking him how he did it what that journey was like how the sale went through how stressful it was how you at home can really set yourself up for uh, an exit of a business and really do well in that and so I'm excited for this episode listen this is the first episode of the brand builder show and I would love to kick off with some momentum Uh, If you do like the content of this episode, the premise of this show, then please do rate it on the podcast app that you're listening on, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever. Tap that five stars. Give us a little review. I would massively, massively appreciate that. Uh, I'm not going to ask that every episode, but it is the first one, so I do need to get that in there. And uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, we're going to be putting these episodes in video format on YouTube as well. We may look at sort of shortening some of them down for YouTube to make it uh, a bit easier to watch in video. Let us know. Give us some feedback back this is your show too uh, i would love to hear from you number one what you think we can do better as each episode goes number two who we can get on the show to really pick their brains uh, my heart my goal with this podcast is to really help those people that come into just selling online or being an amazon seller just to make a little bit of money on the side turn it into a real business a real brand that becomes something that you're proud of but also can provide uh, become an asset that can provide a potential exit for you one day that really helps helps you to live the life that you dream of, provide for your family, do all those amazing things. And so we're going to talk about building valuable businesses uh, along this way with some really valuable guests. So your support in helping us do that would mean the world. I appreciate that. But without further ado, let's jump into the first episode with John Elder. It's going to be a good one. Well, awesome. Welcome to the first ever episode of the Brand Builder Show. John, thanks so much for joining me today. Absolutely, Ben. It's great to be here. It's, a, it's an honor to be on the show. I'm super excited to dive into your journey. Someone who has built and sold an Amazon business for multiple seven figures. What an honor to have you as the first guest. I know it's going to be an action-packed show. Uh, So to kick us off, John, why don't you just give us a little bit about uh, your background, how you first got into selling online, why you got into it, sort of what what are the timelines. Give us a bit of that background and then we'll we'll dig into the story. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, like so many people, the goal is uh, time freedom, financial freedom. And, yeah. and you know, for me, um, you know, I went to I went to University of Washington, um, studied construction management, and I thought I was going to be in that field uh, pretty much forever. You know, you, you get your degree <laughs> and you go in your field and you never leave. Um, yeah. I soon found out that it was just an extremely demanding field. And it was one where you go from one project to another and, you know, the workplace environment might not be suited to you. And you can't control that, obviously. You can't control, you know, the client. You can't control the upper management. Um, so I wanted to start thinking about, you know, business ideas that were time flexible and uh, low, gotcha. you know, low requirements for initial capital investment. So I looked into franchising, but I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna, you know, take out 500 grand for that. Um, I want to do something small that I can scale over time. And so that's where, you know, private labeling. Uh, excuse me, private labeling on Amazon came into play. Um, so it was just, just a ton of research. Um, and I, you know, I kind of gathered my um, idea behind it and uh, started it in 2014. And that's when really the journey started. So I launched my first um, sporting goods product and that uh, became the number one seller in that category uh, pretty much overnight um, and just used the same you know, practices of, you know, exploiting niches and, you know, looking out for, you know, different opportunities and, you know, better materials, better value, better packaging, pretty much being better than every competitor and offering something new and different. Um, And of course, you know, there's mistakes made along the journey, but I just kept learning from each launch that I did and kept growing. And so that led into five total brands. Um, 
and f you know all the all the brands were very successful and then I exited in 2019 um, so I exited right before COVID which is pretty crazy uh, it was a private buyer and that, yeah, that whole process took gosh six actually no nine nine months um, so yeah. the first lending bank um, failed uh, they pulled out of the deal and then the buyer had to find an alternate bank um, yeah. so it was a pretty stressful journey for exiting yeah. uh, not common most most exits happen within four months or less um, yeah. so it's it's a um, it's it's a a rocky journey but one that I learned yeah. a lot from and um, and I'll just mention this so many people you know are not thinking you know five ten years out that was something I did from yeah. day one so on, I had a vision board literally a, a whiteboard and I had a specific uh, multiple seven figure number for an exit someday. And in 2014, it was just kind of an idea. Um, and, and as I yeah. grew the business and was experiencing, you know, hundred percent year over year growth, I'm like, wow, this, 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 we could hit this number, you know, a lot faster. So, um, I hit yeah, the goal yeah. number, um, in under five years and, and exited. So everything I did was focused on that exit. And that's something yeah, that's that good. is so important, especially for people listening is, you know, really think about your goals. Some people, it's a legacy business and they want to pass on to their family. Um, yeah. And that's, that's awesome uh, in its own way. Uh, but vast majority of people do want to exit. So it's really important to focus on, you know, the mechanics of, you know, yeah. keeping your business really clean for an exit. Yeah, that's really good. I'd love to like sort of break it down a little bit from start to finish, really, because you started in 2014, sold in 2019, really before it was trendy, right, to sell an Amazon business, because it's all anyone seems to talk about these days, um, you know, selling an Amazon business, the big exit. Um, but you, you did it before it was uh, before it was trendy, you know, and so how uh, you, you had an idea in mind from the very beginning to sell the business. Uh, before yeah. anybody would have been talking about that, uh, before, you know, uh, there would have been, you know, lots of other things you could have tried to do. A lot of people focus on cash flow, you know, but you had that exit in mind. What was it about uh, an exit that you, that you knew what you wanted to do right from the beginning? Was it, was it business training you had or was it just some, someone told you this is the best way to go about it? What was it that got you focused on that from the beginning? You know, um, thankfully, you know, I grew in my in my Amazon business with lots of seven and eight figure, uh, sellers. Um, mm. and so we mm. all kind of compiled our knowledge, uh, in a, in awesome. a really high level Facebook awesome. group. Um, yeah. and it wasn't any like fancy group. It was just, you know, basically hodgepodge of, of sellers and we just grew over time yeah. and, uh, just sharing that knowledge and information uh, so many of them, uh, exited from their Amazon business, um, in 2018 and 2019 that it made sense to explore the idea and say, hey, you know, let me at least get a business valuation from a from a business broker. And at that time, aggregators weren't yeah. really a thing. So, you know, you had to go the business broker route, which is still a fantastic route now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. the next step was, you know, getting that business valuation, all the numbers checked out. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is mind blowing. You know, this is, this was my goal <laughs> from day one, the exit. That's so good. And yeah. And you know they a broker does all the work for you, so they're doing you know fifty plus interviews. They're only bringing maybe a high level five uh, back to you for question and answer session. Um, yeah. So it's a that whole process was actually uh, pretty strong. Uh, it was a lending process that was a huge pain. So yeah, and I, I mean I've got loads of questions about that that we'll uh, come to. Just like the broker, the you know because I know you can get SBA loans and that kind of thing in America, which we don't have here, which I'd love yeah. to find out more about, but. Um, Going back to the the beginning of the journey when you started the brand, you, you talked about uh, you had five brands. Did you still have five when you sold? Did you sell them all? Or? Yeah, all five brands were sold uh, under one uh, Amazon account. Um, so I didn't sell okay. my entity, my LLC entity. Um, I kept um, the okay. it was an asset sale. So everything yeah. everything related to the business was sold except the business account. So. Uh, Amazon account uh, was sold. Uh, all the design patents, utility patents, everything like that was, you know, went along. Yeah, right. yeah. Nice. Yes. Did you have a lot of patents and protection and stuff like that? Yeah, mainly for like the important stuff. You know, some mm -hmm. unique designs, um, especially some kids' products that were, you know, yeah. had a barrage of, uh, you know, Chinese competitors that kept copying, and so. Um, you know, those design patents are powerful. Um, I had a utility patent yeah. as well for a very specific product yeah. 
it was it was a, it was an accessory product that made an existing product very unique, and so that okay. um, added some uh, really nice protection there uh, in the marketplace. Yeah, good. Yeah, I know that's one of the things because uh, like I'm a big fan of yours on Twitter, and uh, I've been start using Twitter a lot more recently. And I know it's something you've talked about on on Twitter a lot. Is uh, you know the more protection you can have for your brand, the more valuable your valuable valuable is going to be for a potential buyer. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're they're looking at it from a risk analysis. You know, they're, they're mm. looking at it from um, you know you're looking at your forecasted numbers, but they're really looking yeah. at the possibility of expansion in your brand. So it's it's you know there people are getting pickier and pickier, especially aggregators right now. So mm. you, you know it just because something looks really really strong on your P and L statement. You know that doesn't mean that you know they're going to bite anymore. So you know you need to have um, a strong pipeline yeah. of products. You need to have a really strong branding story. And for some people, that's tying into a charity. Uh, for some people, yeah. that's you know there's a deeper meaning to your brand other than you're just selling a product. There's something meaningful behind yeah. the brand. Um, yeah. They're looking for the expansion opportunities now. So things have changed in, in that direction. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, and a question on that because I hear conflicting advice. Some people say, you know, you want to do everything you can to make your brand as attractive as possible, mm -hmm. sell on lots of platforms, build social media, build an audience, all that kind of stuff. And then you also hear people that say, no, actually, these guys are looking for a brand that's doing all of their revenue on Amazon so then they can come and do that stuff. Do you have an opinion on the best sort of balance to find in that? You know what? Um, I, I would go with option one. So, Every buyer I've spoken to, this is aggregators, you know, uh, private equity firms, private buyers, they want to see the concept proven. Now, they're going to take something that you have built and expand it. You know, they have financial capability. They have in-house photography studio stuff. So, you know, they're not – they want they want to see that you have a strong Instagram presence. They want to see that you have a strong presence in Walmart any type of expansion that you had, that's that's great. That's a good thing. So it's proving yeah, that one, your business is actually less risky. So that's extremely risky to buy a business that's that's a hundred percent revenue on Amazon. I mean that's yeah. almost sheer insanity because, you know, Amazon is constantly getting hit with new competitors. In fact. So um I, I, I've never met a single buyer that would say that. That would be more of a, a strategic thing maybe, but mm -hmm. every buyer that I know um, and, and, and you know have relationships with aggregators, they're looking for um, already an established catalog of products um, and mm -hmm. looking for you know a strong following. You know we're talking about your email list as well. You know do you have thousands and thousands of subscribers? Mm -hmm. Well, that it benefits them as a buyer because then they can remarket new product launches to them. So they don't want to have to build those things from scratch. They want to, they want the the bone structure to be strong in your business, yeah. and then they're going to further refine it. So. Yeah, right. Good, good. Okay, coming back to these um, five brands we, for someone that's starting out, is that uh, a methodology that you would say if you were doing it again, you would do that again, or would you focus on one, or what were the? Was it just something that just happened for you and you kind of went with it? How did, how did it play out? Yeah, yeah, it, that was a strategic thing uh, for exiting the business someday. So a lot of brands, uh, or sorry, a lot of Amazon sellers, uh, third party sellers. Um, they get stuck in a single brand, and that's very, very risky because um, you know you need to be diverse. Um, it's no different yeah. than investments. So if you have a brand in the kitchen and home category, if you have a brand in outdoors and maybe a brand in um, sporting goods, um, that gives them flexibility with different markets, with different demographics. Uh, maybe yeah. one category mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. you're selling in has mm -hmm. just terrible pressure from Chinese sellers. And maybe the other one doesn't. Mm. So you know they mm. don't want to have one brand take a huge hit, and then all of a sudden their yeah. uh, their cash flow disappears. So they they want to see yeah. multiple brands. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely something I'd recommend to uh, everyone listening to you know diversify and have multiple brands. Yeah, definitely. And did you, um, you, you know, when you were talking about selling it, were there discussions about siphoning those off into single brands to sell, or was it always going to be the five together? Yeah, one one cohesive package. The the benefit there is that all of your Amazon selling reports are all tied to one cohesive package. Uh, yeah. Also, you know, when you're doing SBA loans, um, especially the um, you know uh, sub five million dollar type loans, you know they yeah. are wanting to see um, you know your tax returns for your business all encompassing. 
So they don't want to have to do yep. weird math and analyze that. That yep. That's a huge con when you're exiting a business. They want to see your tax yep. return be for the entire business. Yep. So if you have 10 brands, they don't want to see a tax yep. return uh, yep. that's spliced up or they have to remove something from um, the revenue that's showing there. Yep. Uh, they want to sure, see sure. all 10 brands under, you know, because you're really, you're going to be showing two years of tax returns and uh, 24 months of uh, P&L statements. So yeah, right. um, there's a lot of data there that uh, is necessary when you're exiting. And so it, mm-hmm. you're not you're not going to want to split things off. It wouldn't make sense. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, random question about SBA loans just out of interest for me. Right? I'm, I'm from the UK and we don't have anything like that. But you can you can buy, you put 10% deposit down, right? Get an SBA loan and buy a business. Um, I don't know the specific number of what's required for that. But yeah, there, there needs to be some cash. And so I, we can actually just walk yeah. through my exit. So I had, uh, yeah. let's see, roughly 20% uh, earn out, which is uh, paid quarterly in perpetuity in the future, okay. as long as they hit um, certain um, net profit goals. Uh, and then oh, the other one was a seller's note, uh, and then the rest yeah. was uh, was cash. So um, okay. Okay. yeah, typically SBA loans, um, you know, you're dealing with loans that are below five million for the lending side, yep. and then yep. you know, obviously that buyer can add in um, a seller note from outside funding. Uh, Earnout is something that's negotiated between you and the in the in the buyer. Um, and then the, the cash, you know, can come from his own resources. It's just a, it's such a crazy uh, concept to, to, especially from the UK, right? There's a, the SBA loans and, and you can just put uh, such a small deposit down and, and buy a business that's generating so much revenue. It's just a crazy world. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's really, really, really cheap money right now. So that's yeah. why, you know, you're, you're seeing so many aggregators and so many private buyers going into this because... Mm-hmm. Just the access to capital right now is 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 very very easy. So it's uh, yeah. it, interesting times for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Let's um, uh, talk about the sort of the preparation stage for the exit then, and then and then maybe a few more questions just on the exit itself and how people can sort of uh, you know yeah. go through that. But uh, were there, are there any sort of key things that you did in the year, two years in the lead up to that exit to prepare for it? You know, knowing that you were going to do that to make sure that you've got the best value for your business? Keeping your business really clean um, and launching sustainably. So you wouldn't want to have any strange dips in your revenue. Um, you wouldn't have, you, you, you just want to launch in a smart way. You don't want to launch too yeah. many products with risk. Um, you sure. wouldn't want to put yourself in a uh, uh, really bad, you know, negative cash position. So yeah. you want to you want to launch sustainably. And, and if you're thinking about exiting, you already have an established catalog of products. Um, you need to be maintaining your your best sellers. Um, that needs to be focus number one is making sure mm-hmm. you know those sales stay consistent um, yeah. all the way up until the exit. And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I get my I get my initial uh, uh, letter of intent and I'm good to go. But that's not true. So what happens is you get that letter of intent. You need to continue during the exit. So let's say it takes takes you uh, you know four months. Those four months you yeah. need to continue to grow. And you need to continue to launch and you need to continue to watch your expenses. You can't just like sit back and be like, oh, you know, the exit's in the bag and uh, I don't need to worry about my business. No, it's actually more important than ever because the bank is going to be asking for all sorts of updated documents. And so if you show this massive drop in revenue, the deal's dead. So you have to, you have to work almost, you know, two jobs, you're running your Amazon business, but you're also you know, supplying all these documents to the bank as needed and making sure that your business is remaining strong month after month during the the, uh, the final contracts uh, being signed. Yeah. Was that a stressful time for you? Um, I've, you know, I've talked to my wife about this and it, it's easily one of the most stressful periods of time in my entire life. So, yeah. you know, it, it's up there with uh, having our two boys and, and seeing, you know, labor <laughs> and the birth experience. Um, but it, it, yeah. it was very, very stressful. Um, it, it, my situation was a little different because the first bank pulled out. Um, and so, you know, it, there was a period of limbo of, you know, is this gonna happen? Um, is the buyer really committed? He was, found a second bank and thankfully everything was fine. Um, but it was, it was very, very stressful. <laughs> yeah. 
Man, I can imagine it's crazy. Um, do you have any recommended, because I know you work now with a lot of sellers that are looking yeah. to go on this journey of doing big exits and that's sort of kind of your sort of latest, you know, I don't want to call it a pivot as such, but I suppose a natural progression of what you're doing. Um, do, do you have sort of like goals, thresholds, you know, you want to hit X amount of revenue and then you want to be aiming for X kind of multiple. Can you put some figures around what, you know, maybe people are listening that have started a year or two ago um, and are wondering what are the numbers they could achieve? What are the numbers they should aim for maybe? If we just look at you know the size of your business in revenue, mm. um, yeah. I would say you should be targeting um, at least a minimum of five million a year in revenue. Okay. Um, yeah. You know that's that's kind of a sweet spot between five and ten million a year. Um, yeah. Some some people exit and and you know with smaller businesses. Uh, one of my clients exited. Um, I think he was right around two million a year in revenue. Okay. So everyone is so different. Now, in terms of multiple, um, as your business gets larger and more intelligent and you garner more um, intellectual property, you know, protection, uh, your brand starts to, you know, you know, get some buzz on social media. If, if you're at that level and let's say you're doing, you know, seven, 10 million a year um, and you're a little, you're a little diversified off of Amazon, um, you sh you should be looking at multiples uh, in the five plus region at this point, okay. um, yeah. and so the reason why there's been a compression of um, people just being picky. So right now, um, especially aggregators aren't buying up every single brand they see. They're being very yeah. very specific now. Um, a yeah. lot of aggregators have had brands fail on them. Um, part of that is they're they're just not good operators. Um, right. Amazon yeah. business is very intense. And yeah. you can't just buy it and assume that everything's going to be fine. For example, you can't even an aggregator can't control you know ten brand new sellers um, undercutting you by like fifty percent on your price. You, know, <laughs> you can't you can't you know do anything about that. So yeah. some of those things have happened, um, but really um, it's an, from an operator standpoint, um, a lot of a lot of brands have failed because of um, improper forecasting uh, in the logistics side. Um, so, you know, going out of stock should never be an option for you. You should do everything in the world to stay in yeah, stock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, they, they have gotten more picky. Um, yeah. It's something that, uh, you know, has changed. And so yeah. now it's all about the brand expansion opportunity. And, uh -huh. um, and, that's, and that's where we are right now. Well, and where do you see the future of it going? Because there's a lot of buzz around the world of aggregators and, you know, Thrasio sending out cold mail pieces all around the world to three letter yeah. boxes. You know, they're, they're, it's like they're desperate to buy businesses, right? But can't go on forever. Uh, you know, people feel like at times they are, uh, there, there's a, a time limit, there's a deadline, they need to build a business so they can sell it quickly. And, you know, uh, the, the opportunity to sell the business might be gone, you know, in, in a year or two. Well, yeah, what are your thoughts about that in the future, you know, five, 10 years? Yeah, that's more tied to aggregator. So in reality, the aggregator uh, mania has actually ended. Um, some of the aggregators have, you know, disappeared, um, you know, gone belly up. You're going to see a lot more of that. But in reality, kind yeah. of like any industry, you're going to see uh, you're going to see aggregators uh, condense a little bit. And, sure. you know, the strong guys are going to, you know, be strong operators and they are going to, you know, get pickier and pickier in terms of acquisitions. And and they're going to be just fine, but you know we're yeah. we're in the seventy plus right now for for number of aggregators, and it is just there's an immense amount of money and immense amount of aggregators that have no idea what they're doing. Um, that's part of my job as well as you know working with some of those aggregators to to kind of right the ship and make sure they stay um, focused on uh, yeah. you know the operation side. Um, but the opportunity is is always going to be there. That's just reality. Everyone, you know, 10, 20 years ago, if you ask somebody, would you like a cash flowing business with 20% profit? <laughs> you know, yeah. 20 years ago, the answer would be yes. 20 years from now, the answer is going to, is going to be yes. So <laughs> um, the opportunity is yeah. there. It might, it might pivot a little bit in terms of what the buyers of businesses will look like. It might transition to private equity firms. It might transition heavily to uh, small business owners. Uh, for example, yeah. I sold to a small business owner. So I didn't sell yeah. to an aggregator. 
um, actually flew to the business owner's uh, property and uh, trained them on site. Um, literally training someone from scratch and then uh, spent 12 months uh, doing additional training with them. Um, wow. Uh, you know, he's in a different state. So yeah, yeah it, it's um, it, the, the, the opportunity is, is going to be there. And uh, that's, I wouldn't, anyone listening, I would not worry about that per se. If you're like really worried yeah. about aggregators, yeah, there's going to be a shorter window for that. And probably in about two years, um, aggregators are going to be ultra picky with who they pick. But mm. there's an entire market of private buyers. These are like small business owners, um, executives who are bored and they want to try something brand new with uh, some money. And yeah. um, that was my situation. He was, a, he was a really high up guy at a software company and he wanted mm. to try something new. Yeah. And he's doing, he's actually doing uh, well and, and making a making money with the business. Um, yeah. and, uh, we stay, we stay in contact with each other, uh, still to this day. So, um, mm. the type of buyer that was a range, you know, a couple of years from now, but right now everyone yeah. is, you know, obsessed with the aggregator, but <laughs> you know, it, it, it's the opportunity to exit is, is not going to change. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good to hear. And, you know, I, I completely agree with that. And that's my thing when people say, is, uh, you know, is the opportunity still, still there as well? Well, people are still buying products and people will still buy products for 20, 30, 100 years, you know. So if you can be an entrepreneur and provide solutions, the, the opportunity is not going anywhere. Absolutely. But, um, Absolutely. That, that was going to be uh, my next question actually was about how the brand is going and how whether that played into your uh, selling process. Were you just like, whoever gives me the most money, okay, let's go, baby? Or did you think, I want to yeah. make sure that this person's going to really succeed with it? You know, what, what was your thought process there? there? There is a portion of that that is very real. So, you, you know, during interviews, you're also interviewing the potential buyer. So mm. you're asking questions like, what's your experience with Amazon? Um, this is yeah. how many hours a week you're going to work. Are you comfortable with that? Um, yeah. Are you comfortable with forecasting numbers and you know making sure things are in stock? So those are questions yeah. that you ask the buyer during that you know that yeah. initial interview. They're of course they're asking you questions as the seller. They're they're asking you you know have you ever been suspended? Uh, tell me about your compet your competition. And, and, and lots of yeah. other questions. So it is a, a joint interview. You want someone who is going to take your business, grow it, and be successful. Um, most of these exits have uh, some earnout money uh, packaged yeah. in it, and so you know you want him to be successful because you know whatever happens with the business um, decides you know that that is the driver for do I get paid this quarter. Um, yeah, yeah. so yeah, that, that's something that's really important to think about. Don't just sell to anyone, sell to the right, uh, buyer, uh, who's really yeah. invested in, in growing the business. Yeah, that's awesome. Of course, you can't talk about details you can't talk about, but you talked about having an ongoing payment from the exit and that's part of what, yeah. uh, you know, is, is the structure that a lot of people will take. So that for you, that that's just going to continue forever whilst the business is going. Yeah, that's that's something that you know that comes with a with a really good lawyer from. So you have counsel from the the selling side of an exit, and um, yeah. you know my lawyer was very adamant about you know we're going to change um, the verbiage of the earnout to say perpetuity. So yeah. some buyers of businesses get really aggressive with that, and they say you know we're going to put a cap of five years on the earnout. Well, if yeah. he messes up the business. And he doesn't pay you out any money in those five years for those quarters. Uh, that money's gone, yeah. and that you know, for for my exit, it was it was uh, close to twenty percent of, of the entire okay. exit. So, you know, that's money that's still on the table and it's being paid out yeah. over time each quarter. Um, but you know, that was you know, that's something that you know, for people listening, make sure you have that in your exit contract language that any earnout is in perpetuity. So basically, what that means. If it takes him ten years to um, to pay me the money, it takes him ten years. Um, if he exits in four years, um, I get paid my earnout from his exit. So it is a set amount, though. It doesn't it just is. keep it's going on. It's a set amount, so just call it right. like a bucket gotcha. of money, and you're pouring yeah. out a little bit of the money from the bucket over time, uh, typically gotcha. every three months. Um, yeah. And and uh, they have to that that net profit uh, threshold number. Um, that's yeah. a negotiated number. Um, so you basically kind of meet somewhere in the middle and you say, okay, that that's fair. 
you know, that makes me a little uncomfortable. That makes you, the buyer, a little uncomfortable. Yeah. So that's kind of like a middle ground. Um, yeah. You know, you want the number to be attainable. Um, and yeah. then also, you know, he also wants to be able to pay that out too, because, you know, yeah. a, a buyer of a business doesn't want this, you know, never ending earn out. He wants to, you know, have total hundred percent control of the business. So, uh, the buyer of my business, yeah, sure. he's definitely itching yeah. to like get that off his bucks. So <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, no, that's good. Good. Okay. Uh, last couple of questions. Cause I know you're a, you're a busy man. Um, you talked about this being a, a cash flow business, a business that you can earn obviously from what's your thoughts on someone that's in the early stages of building the business. Uh, you know, because the, obviously the, the, the bulk of the money you're going to earn is exit, right? But, uh, what's a good time to start paying yourself, taking money out. A lot of people will be, you know, doing this cause they want to get out of their nine to five. They want to work for themselves. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that that balance and, and finding the right timing for that yeah it, you know that's a personal decision that's that that plays into so many unique um aspects but for yeah. me i'll just talk about my story so i had a um very successful career in the commercial uh, construction industry and so you know i have my day job and i have my salary um i didn't really have a need to pay myself uh for a long time so i didn't pay myself I think it was about a year and a half actually where I just reinvested a hundred percent of my profits back into the business. Not everyone does that. Not everyone has to do that. That was just something very aggressive that I did just because I was relying on my, um, you know, normal income. Um, yep. and then, um, you know, after a couple of years I went full time and to prove that just from a risk assessment, I wanted to be able to, to pay myself the same salary as my day job. Um, and it was, it was a great salary. So I wanted to make sure I was able to pay myself that. So I proved that yeah. over six months, uh, you know, got my wife, um, you know, bought into the idea and, and yeah. we felt comfortable with that, uh, that that was the right approach. So, um, you know, it's really important to prove to yourself that you can, um, stay, you know, in a strong cash flow position, uh, maintain a strong business and, and then pay yourself mm -hmm. a salary, um, but do it in a really smart way and don't rush to pay yourself money because a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot and they'll, they'll pay themselves way too much, way too soon. And it's like, what are you doing? Like you have, you have these five other product launches. You need that capital. Um, yeah. So it's just something to think about. Um, but yeah, t typically, you know, I, I would say any Amazon business owner, you know, give it a full year uh, of reinvesting, reinvesting all of your profits. Uh, before you start paying yeah. yourself, uh, but everyone's everyone's so different, and every business is different. So it's it's really hard to say. You know, there's a perfect answer to that. Yeah, no, it's a good good answer. And yeah, I, I know I'm someone that was a victim of trying to do it full time too soon, and uh, you know that definitely slowed growth down. And I think yeah, the longer you can not pay yourself for that, the the better it is, right? Yeah, so absolutely. Think, yeah. yeah. No, that's really good. Awesome. And then just for people that are like at the very beginning of the journey, you know, they might be yeah. listening to this episode thinking, well, that's nice for John. You know, he started five years ago or five years in, he started and sold his business and super excited for him. But I'm just at the beginning. Like, how do I even get there? Like, what would be the, the fundamentals that you would say to someone right at the beginning yeah. of the journey that's, that dreams of that seven figure exit? Yeah, that's actually something that I that I go through with my clients all the time, um, especially the the beginner type sellers. Uh, yeah. But you know, number one, pursue something you're passionate about. So many people get into yeah. business, you know, product ideas that they have zero interest in. Like for example, I would never go into makeup. I have zero interest in makeup, <laughs> even though it might it might be strong on paper. Um, yeah. it's just not something that I would go into. So go into something you're really passionate in. Um, and the reason why is because you're going to have to innovate a lot along the way. So you're going to have to always be thinking, you know, from a perspective of how can I make this product better every single yeah. year? How can I improve it? How can I attach accessory items to it? How can I increase the value, um, the material quality? All of those elements need to sing together. And so to do that, there has to be some passion. You can't just be like, oh, I don't even, I don't even care about my product, but it makes money. That's not how it works on Amazon. On Amazon, you have to continue to innovate and continue to improve your product. So there has to be interest there. Um, so you know, start with um, you know from a high level. Look at categories that you're interested in. Um, I had a client that was in the in the boating uh, category, and he was really interested in you know uh, wakeboarding products. And so start yes. there and, and yeah. go dig down, spend some time in retail stores uh, for things you're interested in, go look at products, physically touch them, see if there's um, stuff that you can improve upon. 
Um, yeah. And then also, um, you know, start just l- using a tool like Jungle Scout, for example, and looking at the, the existing competition, looking at uh, what competitors are doing for their revenue, uh, doing some simple math for uh, potential net profit for products, um, and then uh, yeah. just you know exploiting opportunity. If there, if you see a consistent pattern of um, you know, uh, you know, there's there's products with a whole bunch of negative reviews. And, and none of the sellers are solving them. Well, what you can do is you can go in, mine that data, and work with a factory and yeah. solve all of those negative reviews and produce a product that's that's amazing. So that's that's where I would start. Yeah, definitely. And then it's a case of rinse and repeat, right? And you, you did that over five years. Yeah, and that's yeah. You're you're repeating the same thing and you're getting better at it over time. Um, and and you're you're learning you know what to not waste time on and what to really focus on and honestly I yeah. probably focused eighty to ninety percent of my time on product innovation you know really thinking awesome. about how is this product going to be better from the moment they receive it um, all the touch points what is the packaging yeah. going to feel like in their hands uh, what does that insert card say um, what what's yeah. the branding story of the product you know how is it going to improve their life. Um, I had a product line uh, where yeah. um, uh, partnered with a local uh, veterans company. Uh, it was a men's high-end leather, uh, really uh, rugged uh, uh, leather uh, goods company, and uh, yeah. that was part of the story. So uh, people really enjoyed that. You know, be a brand that you know does more than just sell a physical product. Um, do something else uh, and make it meaningful for the customer. Yeah, that's really good. That's awesome. I, I know I said that um, last one would be my last question, but just as you're talking about how, uh, you know, focusing your time on innovating with products, it just sort of uh, came to mind about where you ended up with team, you know, five brands, multiple seven figure exit. And I know, again, on, on Twitter, you talk a lot about the power of outsourcing. Um, yeah. Talk to us about just that final team, you know, and how you came to that point. Yeah, so outsourcing is something that um, a lot of people are, you know, really unsure about. Um, so you can utilize, um, you know, the Philippines are that's an amazing resource for employees. Um, so if you're looking yeah. for a VA uh, take over customer service, that'd be the first thing to outsource. You know, the number of emails every single day you get from Amazon customers just increases exponentially as you scale. And so hiring someone for that. And, uh, you know, letting you know, you know, having something like Amazon Alert um, send your VA alerts if there's like an issue with the listing uh, and, and possibly giving your VA access to fix the listing. So, you know, if there's yeah. photography involved, set up a Google Drive account and, you know, mm-hmm. keep that stored locally and, and allow them to uh, fix things on the go. So, yeah. um, really really the key is to outsource everything except the important stuff. And so as a business owner, that would be your financials and that would be product innovation and product launches. So I spent a lot of time really focused on uh, potential product ideas uh, and, and launching those. So everything else was outsourced. So for example, logistics was outsourced. Uh, I had an American employee uh, working actually full time and uh, he did he did everything from logistics to helping the VA with customer service, um, you know, uh, uh, things like um, uh, PPC were outsourced uh, to an agency. Mm. Uh, okay. My Facebook and Instagram marketing was outsourced to an agency as well. Uh, okay. So those are those are things that you want to outsource when it makes financial sense. Obviously, everyone is going to bootstrap along the way. Uh, the yeah. key is to outsource that very, very fast. So yeah. that's part of the reinvesting in your business that's beneficial. Um, it might make sense to, you know, instead of paying yourself too soon, using that money to, you know, pay that monthly fee for a PPC agency and, and just have them skyrocket your sales because that takes up yeah. hours and hours of your time if you DIY it. Um, so that's yeah. that. Those are all things um, I recommend outsourcing. And obviously, photography and video production. Yeah, no, it's so true. It's, uh, you know, outsourcing is something that can really free up so much time. And, and you obviously use that really well to create the leverage to grow your business. So definitely uh, really enjoyed hearing your thoughts on, yeah. uh, you know, someone who's been there, done it and, um, you know, built something really substantial. So uh, I feel like I could ask you questions all day. I've got so many more, but I know yeah, you're a busy man and want to keep this episode. <laughs> 
Yeah, definitely. No, that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. Have you got any plans to do anything more in e-commerce or are you focusing solely in the uh, yeah, advisory yeah, space? Yeah, definitely. Now? Definitely. Yeah. Once you get your feet wet in e-commerce, you never truly, you know, you're never truly done with it. Um, especially for me as, as mm. a business owner, um, it's just such a passion, you know, the products business. Um, so, yeah. um, I've definitely dabbled with the idea of launching a baby in the USA type product line. Uh, it's definitely yeah. very, very hard to do that. Uh, but it's something yeah. that uh, would be really, really interesting and fun to, to, uh, to accomplish. So, um, that's something that I'm considering. And obviously right now, um, you know, we're working in building up black label advisor. That's been so incredibly busy, everything from, you know, media outlet interviews. Uh, I was on Forbes last Dude. week and yeah, just, you man. know, podcast, this podcast. So, um, yeah. that's been keeping me really busy. And then obviously working with my clients. So it's been, a, yeah. it's been a good journey so far. Yeah. Awesome. And, and tell us a bit about that to finish. Tell us where people can find out more about you yeah. and follow you and get in contact with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, my website's blacklabeladvisor.com. Uh, and then if you want to shoot me an email, it's uh, J-O-N-E-L-D-E-R at blacklabeladvisor.com. Uh, and then on, the, on my website, I also have all my social uh, social media links. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, typically what I do with people, I would say 90% of my clients, uh, they work with me on a one to two hour a month basis. And so we're doing high yeah. level calls, consulting, going over branding issues, going over logistics issues. Uh, all my clients obviously get get access to my entire contact list for all the different service based companies, yeah. um, and I'm actually right now there's about 15 minutes to go on the giveaway, so you know I have relationships with uh, just awesome software companies uh, like Atida and uh, Feedback Wiz, in others Merchant Words, and so um, yeah, so you know my job as a consultant is to help people you know scale sustainably in a smart way and, and achieve the success yeah. I had. Um, and it's, uh, it's just, it's just a fun experience just meeting people from all over the world as well. Definitely. Definitely. That's awesome. Well, like I said, I've been following you for a while and, uh, someone of not only the, the skill, but of, uh, you know, good character as well. And that doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't always come around in this industry. So highly recommend yeah. people getting in touch and following along on social media and, um, yeah, looking forward to seeing how the journey continues to unfold, John. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was so great to be on today, Ben. Sheesh, what an episode that was with John Elder. What a legend, right? Uh, man, I just got so much out of that. Personally, like I said in the interview, I could have just been uh, asking him questions all day long there. I feel like that was like some free consulting time for me. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, but it's amazing, right? What, what can be achieved in a short period of time? What we're seeing in the e-commerce space right now is nothing short of sensational. And uh, what John gave us there in terms of tips and strategy was fundamental to really grow growing something strong so go give john a follow on twitter go find him on a social media visit his website check out all his stuff there let him know you love the episode and if you did like the episode please do let me know as well let me know your feedback what you thought was good bad or ugly and uh and we will definitely work to keep making this the best brand build-up podcast on the planet and uh, appreciate all the feedback you give of course if you can give us a review on itunes spotify google wherever you listen to podcasts these days and also subscribe on youtube like the video would massively appreciate it. But above all, I hope this episode has helped you on your journey of becoming a brand builder. And I'll see you in the next episode real soon.